I have discovered the holy grail of science, Mr. Laurent. I give life. The agnates, they're simply tools, instruments. They have no souls. The possibilities are endless here. In two years' time, I'll be able to cure children's leukemia. How many people on earth can say that, Mr. Laurent? Hmm. I wonder if I've seen this. Interesting. Something about a scientist saying that he's has some kind of cure, huh? Yee. Hmm. Do you think I've seen this before? I maybe I don't know. You've seen like a gazillion movies, so it's hard to say. <laughs> you can always check my fa letterbox. I mean, um, that's true. That's what I'm doing right now, as we speak. Uh -huh. Any uh, hints you can throw my? It sounds pretty old school. Is it a period piece? Nope. It no. Is, it is. In the year that it was made, it is set in the future. Oh. Yes, I think huh. this is what. You have, in fact, seen this movie. Okay. So it was made in the 2000s about the future. It was made in 2005, and if my memory serves, it takes place in 2015. It stars uh, one of my favorite actors in Scarlett Johansson. Is it the island? It is, in fact, the island. <laughs> <laughs> what up? Only, only the Scarlett Johansson thing gave, gave that away with me. Well, wow. I was trying to be completely obvious. That's um, Hugh and McGre McGregor? Yes, it is, uh, it is uh, Black Widow and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Gosh, it's been a long time since I've seen that Michael Bay flick. It has been quite a long time since I've seen that movie as well. <laughs> Could that tie back into Paul Thomas Anderson? We will find out. Uh, welcome to season three, episode five of the Average Joe's Movie Club Cast. I'm Justin, and I'm Joey. Tonight, the fate of the world is at stake as we check out two very different stories about the critical battle between the Nazis and Soviets. As we chat about an American film, Enemy at the Gates, from 2001, and a German film. I think it's German. It's probably German. Stalingrad, from I'm 1993. Sure yeah, I'm pretty sure it's uh, it's the it's German. Like, very very sure that it's German. Okay. I'm supposed to check that kind of stuff, Justin. Jeez, gosh, God, you're so horrible. Jeez, I'm a total slacker. But with that all being said. We do discuss our full thoughts on all of these movies. So if you haven't seen them and you don't want anything spoiled, skip ahead. Come back when you've seen them, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah, me, uh, me and Joey are two old friends. So um, yeah, we're gonna leave in these little uh, jabs we like to make at each other because he likes to start shit, and then I like I have to counter at some point. So keep look, things fair. Look, I don't start shit. I finish shit. Ah. <laughs> All right. So. Um, Moving on with the proceedings, and if you want to be a part of the movie club and uh, join our shenanigans, uh, please hit that 
like and subscribe button, that bell notification on the YouTubes, leave us a comment on the other platforms. We would love to hear from you. So, oh my God, spring fever is in uh, full effect and I'm busy as hell. Ugh. So, pretty much every day of the week, I'm swamped with uh, either t-ball or baseball from one of my two sons. I'm a t-ball coach which I have a really young team. And so first two games, we've been kind of getting our ass kicked, which is kind of pretty lousy since I'm a um, pretty competitive guy. And then, um, so one of the moms, like, so I had a practice last night and she accidentally put on the group text message that she's like, of all the places I could be right now, I'm at T-ball practice. And I'm like, and she's like, oh, I didn't mean to post that here. I mean, I don't know if she did or not, but I was like, oh, all this, you're working so hard there from the sideline, ma'am. And now, uh, you know, I'm here, you know, trying to get your four-year-old to, you know, play first base. So, oh, it's a lot. So this might be the last year I, I do the, the coaching thing. I, I'm, I think I'm more cut out to be assistant, even though I do come up with fun stuff. Like, um, so we're the hammerheads. So like to get like started, we do, we like do this like, clap thing and we say chomp 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 and I said what time is it and they all say hammer time which is really cute um but that doesn't really equate to getting outs unfortunately on defense so yeah I mean you said they were four right I mean it's it, it runs from I have one three-year-old all the way up to um six so I mean, it's just the older kids aren't really um they're kind of freezing whenever they get the ball gets hit. So that's the main thing we got to try to get them out of. And a lot of the older kids aren't showing up to practice. So, yeah, hopefully things will turn around. But we're only playing – we only play two teams. Like, we have ten games against two teams. So it's, like, not like we still have, like, the uh, the duds of the league to play. Because like, we're, we're unfortunately that at this point. I mean, they are kids. It is all just fun. Yeah, but – I don't want to lose every game, man. <laughs> I mean, no, that's that's fair, but I mean, these these it's not like oh, these are 12, 12 or thirteen year old kids. These are like three to six year olds. They're pretty young. So. Yeah, lots of daisy pickers. Um, but <laughs> halfway through the season, like so, the thing in T ball we, I learned was it's mostly about getting teaching kids how to tag other kids out by grabbing the ball and running them down. But um, our league's doing this thing where halfway through the season, they, they're they going to make us try to get the kids to throw to get outs. So um, hopefully that make that, that might make the competitive field a little more interesting. So we shall see. Um, yeah, I was back on my diet real hard. And then um, my son turned seven uh, last weekend. So I hosted a uh, spin the night and grabbed, uh, you know, we got a bunch of junk food. So. Kind of pigged out on that and that the residual effects, <laughs> effects of that have been going all week. But I need to get back on my diet starting tomorrow. But I have gotten into going to the gym. Um, my kids take this um, like Ninja Warrior class. At, so there's like a Bold Fitness and right next door there's a Bold Fitness uh, Gymnastics and Ninja. So I take them twice a week to go do like the Ninja Warrior class. And then I sneak off and go do about an hour at the gym. So yeah, getting some weight lifting in. That's supposed to, you know help the body yeah a little bit a little bit so yeah it's have you ever been a gym guy um not heavy there was a little while where i, I up into uh like 2018 and into the like the first half of 2019 like i did the gym um pretty regularly um there were some spots where i would stop but um what would you I do when you were there uh, I, I did some cardio, and then, you know, I would just switch between, like, upper and lower body. Um, like I said, I was going three, three, like, three or four times a week. Like, I was going pretty consistently, and, and I was going so I could be in better shape for when we went to Disney World, and I wouldn't just die walking <laughs> around all day. And then we went to Disney World, and so, you know, it's a week, and, I mean... You know how you eat on vacation, especially somewhere like that. I mean, yeah. and then I came home and I was just exhausted, you know, and I was like, okay, I'll give it a week to get back, you know, get back home, get situated back in. And then, uh, so that was in June of 2019. 
We are in April of 2021. I have not been back to the gym. Uh-huh. <laughs> I kept the membership to like November of 2019 as well. Like I paid for it for like six months without using it. I don't know. Um, and then, you know, last year happened when you couldn't really go to a gym and stuff. So, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I pretty much like tonight I was able to sneak away. Um, cause my, my wife really doesn't want me to have the membership. So I'm kind of doing it on the low key talking about this on a podcast. Hopefully that she'll never hear. But, um, <laughs> what, it, it, does she not want you to have it because of like the pandemic? Um, that was her reason for not wanting me to join P- planet fitness a few weeks ago, uh, or a few months ago, I should say. But, um, I don't know. I think it's just either the money or maybe like me going makes it feel guilty that she's not going. I don't know. Something like that. But, um, I yeah. Mean, PF is like dirt cheap. Like I'm pretty sure I just saw an advertisement of sign up for a dollar. <laughs> like. Yeah, and Bold's a little bit more expensive, um, but it's a pretty popular gym, so it's kind of it's kind of good to be in that little gym atmosphere. And yeah, I go loosen up in the sauna and do a little cardio, and I actually do all the circuit circuit machines and bench pressing and curls and stuff. So yeah, it's it's been. I'm trying to do a moderate amount of weight, so like I don't like bulk up, and then like if I stop, you know, that I'll turn to fat. That's yeah, I've been that guy before, so I'm trying to avoid that. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I still do the whole walk around the neighborhood thing, which is, you know, is what it is. But, um, yeah, the, it's kind of nice to change things up now with the, the weather improving, go on a few bike rides and, you know, just kind of diversify, you know, staying, staying active. Yeah, I gotta, I've been stuck at this, um, the same weight ever since like December. So I, I gotta really crack down and get, get to my goal. So. Yeah, just, you know, remind it that just, even though you're doing it, you know, it's not a race, brother. Just, just get there and especially yeah. if you're going to start lifting, you start lifting weights, you might not get there because you might gain weight. Yeah, yeah, I kind of expected that. I mean, I do feel re- a lot better than I, I was. I mean, I lost 30 pounds, so definitely better. But, um, yeah, I just want to keep just keep on track. So, um, yeah, into a few TV shows now. Watching that uh, Winter Soldier and uh, Falcon each week. That's uh, much more action-packed than uh, WandaVision was. So, enjoying that. And then I was also watching the Mighty Ducks Game Changers series on uh, Disney+. And I went to log that last week. And uh, Letterboxd, they decided to remove that show. So, I lost credit for all my Mighty Ducks. But, man, it, this show is moving dirt, dirt slow. Probably one of the reasons why I'm not that big into series TV, but I'm gonna stick it with it. Stick with it. Want to see how it all turns out in the end. Um, so watching that with the kids, and then um, so I have this thing called the three um, the three timers club. It's movies that like I sit down to watch and like I'll fall asleep, and then the next night I'll sit down and watch it. Well, probably a little more, and then unfortunately I'll fall asleep. But no no fault to the movie itself, but uh. Either, you know, a few many, too many drinks, just too tired in general, and just lose focus and fall asleep. So, um, the newest member of that club is uh, Bringing Up Baby. I really want to get through this movie. It's, it's, it, was, I mean, it seems pretty entertaining. It's just, I haven't been able to keep my peepers open. So, have you ever had that trouble with movies? Um, well, first, I would like to state that, you know, starting movies at like 1 a.m. will, will kind of do that to you. Yep. Two, um, typically, um, if I've come home and it's after a long day or I've just eaten or something, you, you know, if I'm on the couch, there, there are some movies like I want to watch and I, I, I'll have to pause it and like throw cold water in my face or something. Cause, cause it ain't happening. Um, mm-hmm. typically if I am in my chair, like where I'm sitting now and watching a movie in my room, it's usually not that bad. But you know, if I, if I'm watching a movie on the couch, some, it's just sometimes it, there ain't no stopping it. I'm just, I'm just gone. Yeah, so like other weird members of this club are like the nice guys. It took me like three times to get through that for some reason. And the it, the Russell the Russell Crowe of uh, Ryan Gosling movie. Yeah, or is that? Um, I mean, it's no fault of the movie itself. It just just caught me in a certain period of time where I was exhausted, had a couple drinks, and there I was out. So it took a few times to get through it. Um, I recently rewatched that a few months ago. Had a really good time with it. I mean, it's a good, good flick. Um, 
yeah, I, hopefully after this podcast uh, wraps up, <laughs> I'll get through it. But um, that's what I told myself bro, last night. Bro, we, we are starting after at like, it's 1130 right now. We yeah. haven't even started talking about one movie. And because you had to be that guy and add an extra movie, we have three movies to talk about. I don't think you're making it through a, a movie tonight, homie. I'm just I'm just being realistic. It's Saturday night. Anything can happen. <laughs> you're married with three kids, brother. Anything going and, on with and, you? And, and, and we're old. Getting um, there. Yeah. So I mean, basically, I'm I'm just working. Uh, I junked my other car, the Versa. I'm sure we talked about this on the last episode. So I finally junked that. I got a little bit more money, and I'm just looking for a car. Every time I find one that's decent in my price range, you know, it's, oh, it's already sold or, you know, whatever. Mm. So, like, today, I probably, if I had been off work, I probably could have got one. But since I was at work, Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I'm coming tomorrow. And they're like, nope, just sold it, you know. Anybody else throw your love on the um, GoFundMe? Um. A little bit since the last time. Uh, That's good. Uh, and then someone, uh, one of my friend's moms, just gave me money in person. So that works too. Yeah. So I mean, I've I've got that money. So anybody who listens to this has donated. I do greatly appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. And the money is not being wasted. It is sitting in my savings account, waiting to uh, waiting to be put to good use. So hopefully. Like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm off the next two days, so hopefully, maybe one of those two days I'll find something. So, we'll see. All right, let's get into some movie talk with uh, the "What Would You Watch" game. So it's my turn, and I was looking through your five star movies. So Joey, what would you rather watch, Clueless or Mean Girls? <laughs> mean Girls. <laughs> oh. I. Like, don't get me wrong, I, like, I like Clues, I think it was great, um, obviously, but it's, uh, and, and on, probably without Clueless and Jawbreaker, there's, and I guess some people would say Heathers, but Heathers fucking sucks, um, oh. you know, Mean Girls, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I just, I mean, I bought a... I did an unboxing for that Mean Girls Collector's Edition, the Burn Book Edition, and, I mean, let's be real, Mean Girls is just so fetch. It's been a long time since I've seen either one of them. Um, I I remember watching Clueless, like, we recorded off the pay-per-view back in the day, and so I watched it quite a bit. Um, I don't know, it was just, it kind of clicked with me, too, at the time. I was in, I don't know, what year did that come out? Like, 96? Like Ninety five, ninety six, yeah. I was probably in elementary school, and yeah, I just watched that movie a bunch. I thought it was fun. Um, I've only seen Mean Girls the one time, I guess because that probably came out when I was in college. So, yeah, I'd like to see both of them at some point. Um, but probably Clueless would be first. Also, Mean Girls is kind of like my closer movie. Um, closer? So, uh, yeah, so, you know, you go... I'm sure you've not done this in a while. You've been married since we were like 16 years old. Um, Come on now. So it's, it's, it's my, it's, you know, I bring someone home on a date. Oh, um, okay. It's my closer movie. Yeah. Because typically most girls have seen Mean Girls. They're super impressed that I enjoy the movie. And then we can sit there and we can talk and whatever, pay attention to the movie and Thus, things one thing usually leads to another, et cetera, et cetera. That's a much better. That's a much better closer movie than the Goonies. <laughs> I mean, one of, one of, I, I one tried of my, to close with one time. <laughs> truffle, truffle. One of my buddies' uh, closer movies is um, Lost Boys. All right, all right. So that I mean, but you know, vampires and. All that kind of stuff. So, yeah, probably a little better 80s movie for that than, than The Goonies. Yeah, that's more nostalgia. It's like, hey, this is what it used to feel like when I was a kid. All right, let's talk about more movies with what we've been watching lately with the good, the bad, and the ugly.
All right, so I have juking those stats, going the extra mile, and the ugly. I have D and D better than I expected, and Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> let's uh, let's hear about your um, I guess Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> All right, awesome. So. Uh, actually has nothing to do with wrestling in any way shape or form oh, <laughs> but fooled me um so the movie is horrible bosses and the reason that oh. i called it stone cold steve austin is if you know anything about his storyline was that the villain was vince mcmahon his boss and how everybody wishes they could do to vince mcmahon what stone cold did which was beat the shit out of him basically every week so horrible bosses is comedy in which these three characters hate their bosses and then decide on a whim to kill them and <laughs> on a whim. well okay their bosses are kevin spacey back before we knew that he was a piece of shit pedophile yeah um colin farrell and then jennifer aniston <laughs> and jake is jason sudeikis charlie day and uh, why I'm uh, Bateman, Jason Bateman. And they're just like these bumbling idiots trying to, uh, you know, murder their bosses and use each other to do it. And Jamie Foxx is in it and he's their murder, like, aficionado. It's, it's, it's just a dumb comedy, but it was hilarious. Um, and all the, you know, there was too many good actors for it to just not be funny. Right on. All right, yeah, brother. I saw that a few years ago. Enjoyed it. I don't think I've ever saw part two, though. I have not seen that, but um, our good friend Johnny has loaned it to me. So, um, I'll, uh, because, you know, now we, we get movies from our good friend Johnny instead of taping them off of the, um, off of the pay-per-view. <laughs> yep. Johnny's a great so, guy. Yeah, Johnny, Johnny is, Johnny is my boy. Got um, the hook up. <laughs> huh? Got the hookup. Yeah, he does got the hookup. He's he's like Big Papa Pump. But anyway, um, <laughs> let's go with um, let's just do the ugly because it looks like it has a long ass title. All right. So uh, the ugly is um, so I watched all the uh, X Men movies last year, and I've been trying to talk my kids into starting the Wolverine franchise because. Yeah, we got to do that too. So we got to start somewhere with the Wolverine franchise. So we saw X Men. Say anything else, brother? Origins, Wolverine. So I remember seeing this movie in the theater and thinking like, it's all right, but oh god, this is a cheese fest. Um, no, hold on. Don't, don't, don't bad name the. Bad mouth the name of cheese like that, goddamn. <laughs> There's some of these shots where Wolverine's like does the whole Darth Vader no thing up in the sky and I got a kick out of where he's like visiting Mom Pa Kent essentially and then they get gunned down and the the rules of gravity don't apply whatsoever in this movie. I mean they're mutants, but still I mean it'd be nice if they weren't just kind of floating around. Um yeah, Strikers and so many gosh darn X-Men movies. And we just had to tell uh, X-Men uh, 2, X-Men United, uh, we needed to tell the whole gist of Wolfie Wolverine um, turning into, you know, Animantium dude again, because that was apparently had to happen. Um, obviously, they disgrace Deadpool. We've heard that a million times. Um, well, I am's in this movie. That's a thing. Um Cyclops doesn't suck in the movie. He makes an appearance. Gambit shows up. So two little things to hang your hat on. But otherwise, yeah, X-Men uh, Origins had, gosh, um, gosh, what's the name of the guy who plays uh, Sabretooth in this? He does this little, like, cheetah run thing that's, like, you know, like, with wire work or whatever, and it just looks awful. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember who's... Um, Sabretooth in that because it's Leah Shriver in X Men, but I don't remember who it is in this movie. That sounds familiar. Uh, is he? He's um, the killer, the guy that they think is the killer in Scream. That's isn't that Lee Shriver? 
Yes, he, his wife, he's Cotton, and his wife was having an affair with Sydney's dad. Yeah, that's that's and that's both... who Sabretooth is in this movie. Oh, okay, so he's in that movie, not the first not... one. Then. Right. Okay, I don't remember. I, I don't remember what the name was of the guy in the first one. He was kind of unmemorable too, but at least he looked kind of looked like Sabretooth compared to, you know, Lisa Shriver. So, um, yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much as bad as what everyone used to say. So, uh, kind of missed the bone claws after how disgracefully cheesy those uh, CGI ones are later on. Uh, his name is Tyler Maine. I have no clue who he is, but you know, hey, there you go. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so D and D. D and D. All right, that is uh, onward. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was that was a damn good movie. Um, cool. I sat there. I sat there. Spent a decent part of the first part of the movie trying to figure out the voices because I was like, I recognize these voices, mm-hmm. and then it turns out that it was Spider Man and Star Lord. So. Yep. Um. But yeah, no, it just, it just felt like, I mean, I, I, have you seen this one? A couple times, yeah. Okay, so you, you mean, obviously, it's, it is a D&D campaign, essentially. They're basically playing D&D, or the brothers obsessed with D&D. Yeah. I mean, it just felt like a D&D campaign. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I mean, obviously, some parts of it are cheesy, but it, it's a, it is a movie made for children, so. Yeah, but, it gives those yeah. Uh, Pixar feels toward the end there. Yeah, um, yeah, it was really good. And if you, you like anything, any sort of fantasy or you know dragons or D and D and Disney movies, like I mean either or, like I feel like you'll you'll be in for a good time watching this. Mm-hmm. Yep, onwards a good time. Not the best Pixar movie of last year, but certainly very fun one. Yeah, I remember talking to Carl a little bit on Letterbox about mm-hmm. that because I remember he enjoyed it quite a bit too. Yeah, go go figure. the the two The two big D and D or the two big nerds would enjoy it. <laughs> so, all right, what is your juking the stats? All right, so if you've been visiting my letterbox um, at all in the last couple of weeks, you've noticed that I've gone t- Looney Tunes nuts. So, like, I get at least two reviews in a day now. Because I'm watching these like seven, eight minute um, Chuck Jones uh, Looney Tunes. Because I mean, I found out they were on HBO, and I was like, "There's all these ones you can log on Letterbox." So let's go down Nostalgia Road and check these puppies out. And you know, each one's a real fun experience. It's so, are you? It's just literally episodes of Looney Tunes. Yep. Okay. Yep. So um, I mean, they're 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 short films essentially. Um. So yeah. Gone through a bunch, one with Marvin Martian, um, all kinds of stuff with uh, Daffy Duck and Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny. And um, yeah, it's, it's it's really cool to kind of take a um, kind of a look back at all this stuff. I, they played this stuff all the time whenever um, on Nickelodeon back in the 90s. And it blows my mind they were actually made in like the, throughout the 50s. So, and I mean, they are such timeless cartoons that are still funny. It's kind of a shame that kids don't get the same uh, jokes these days. And, and I mean, there's the mo- there's the episode with the, the duck season, rabbit season one. And uh, Daffy's like, keeps getting blasted in the face with a shotgun. And it, basically all it does is spin his beak around. But uh, it's like, yeah, you probably couldn't shove a gun in a character's face and shoot him multiple times in an episode in a um, cartoon anymore. So but these these same kids are playing Fortnite, so yeah. So I mean, it, and my thing is there is it's just as unrealistic because you're killing people and there's not really any blood and you're mm-hmm. building shit at instantaneous speed and you know oh we died well we're just right back in the next the next game or my buddy walked over and kneeled beside me for five seconds and I'm back up it's like mm-hmm. just as unrealistic as a sentient rabbit and sentient duck shooting each other so sentient that's funny you mentioned that because i also watched bowling for columbine this week oh but nice I, but i wasn't planning on talking about that well i guess i shouldn't sentient probably is not the correct term there that they're, they're they cartoon well yes but they're they're in the cartoons they are portrayed almost 
they're all misportrayed human-like in how that they stand and talk and walk is what I was going for. They're obviously sentient creatures, ducks and rabbits, as they are creatures who live. But, <laughs> yeah, so... But yeah, it's fun to go back through these episodes and uh, recall where some of the, um, you know, some of these classic lines, duck season, rabbit season, killed a wabbit, killed a wabbit, all come from. So, yeah, probably after the show, I'll watch another Looney Tune short and log it. Why not? Yes, just, uh, it's not even juking the stats, that's just uh, inflating the stats, but I have comedy specials, so I can't say anything. I use those too, but I generally don't write anything about those. Sometimes I do, but generally not. There's really a, there's a, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to, um, you know, stretch seven minutes worth of content into like a, you know, a small review. So, nice new challenge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I only got one left. <laughs> my, my review for a... Uh, a seven minute cartoons longer than Joey's review for like a four hour movie. <laughs> well, yes, because, you know, I'm just trying to hit the hot spots. I'm not trying to write a goddamn essay. My essay writing days are over like 18 years ago. So uh, it's my day to day, brother. All right. I, so, yeah, better than I expected. Oblivion. I haven't seen this. Tom Cruise, right? Yeah, Tom Cruise, uh, Morgan Freeman, because, well, he's in everything. <laughs> I am Morgan Freeman. Yeah, um, Olga, Olga Kurilenko. Um, you know, futuristic sci-fi movie, like, obviously, it's not it's not winning any awards or anything, but, you know, it was just, it was fun. Uh, I had a good time watching it. Like, it had been on the back of my watch list for probably since I started Letterboxd, so, like, four years ago. Um it was the same thing with Horrible Bosses. Like, it was just, those were, like, the two oldest movies on my watch list that were still there. So, I, uh, wow. yeah. Um, and that's another thing I've been trying to do is uh, I turn my favorite movies into, like, movies I'm going to try to watch that are outside of, you know, like, mine and Carl's movie shuffle or, like, for the club or whatever. So, hopefully, I'll get some good stuff that way. But, yeah, no, it's just good sci-fi. You got, in a you know, post-apocalyptic future, um, and there's a good little twist at the end. So, it's nice. fun time. Looks good. Yeah, I need to, still need to see it. I think I think it. Well, I rented it for like two dollars on Prime. And it was like on sale for rent. So, now that's interesting. Yeah. All right, what is going the extra mile? All right, so. Uh... I believe it was Nick who recommended that we check out a war movie called uh, The Beast or Beast of War from 1988. So yes, after I completed uh, the required viewing, I went ahead and checked this one out. So I'll, uh, I'll spread the good word. So yeah, submarine and tank flicks are far and few between, so it's good to run into a new one. Um, this one has a lot of good brutality in it, so it's about the... Um, Afghan uh, Soviet war back in the late 80s whenever the Soviets thought they could do whatever they want but yet um, you know like the United States gave all these weapons to the Taliban to fight the Soviets oops so um, yeah we have our movie I think there's let's see Rocky 3 has this premise and Charlie Wilson's war takes place in this time period and also uh, the uh, beast of war mm -hmm. you're talking about um, Americans fighting Soviets no Soviets fighting Afghanistan. Uh, well, Rocky three. You mean Rambo? 3. Oh, Rambo three. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, that's why. Rocky four. He fights the Soviet. No, Rocky. Rocky three, uh, he fights Mister T. <laughs> no, in Rambo three, he shows up in Afghanistan and starts blowing away Soviets. <laughs> I mean, uh, look, it's correction. sly in the eighties. Starts with an R. Like mm. it's all gravy. But um, essentially, yeah, so this is about this asshole Soviet uh, tank commander who, yeah, they roll up into this Afghan town and they blow the shit out of it, catch people on fire, say, ask them where, you know, where the other ones are hiding, and when they don't, they crush them with a the tank. And so, um, so then a band of them set out, they get an RPG, and they go after this tank that ends up on its own, and so it's trucking through the desert on low fumes, and, um, 
you know, a bit of a morality tale here because one of the Soviet guys has kind of a, a change of heart throughout the, the course of the movie. Um, it has a little bit of AZ's cheese to it, but for the for the grand total of it, I, I you know really enjoyed it. Um, a lot of great um, camera work seeing, seeing this um, tank trucking through the desert and the different weapons that you get to see the tank have as it's going. Um, Stephen, is it Stephen Baldwin? What's the goofy Baldwin brother? Um, that was in Biodome. That's Stephen, that right? Stephen I think that's Stephen Baldwin. Yeah, he's in this. Um, Scarface's main man, um, who he ends up gunning down at the end of that movie, he plays this Afghanistan, um, Afghani, uh, like, freedom vengeance fighter. So, um, yeah, some interesting casting. I guess one of the things that threw me is I don't really mind, like, how Hollywood movies will, um, have like Soviets talking English, but so the Soviets in this movie talked English, but the Afghanistan folks like apparently were talking, you know, their native tongue. So it was weird because like as the movie goes along, like your allegiance shifts from like the Soviets who were hanging out with the whole time over to the freedom fighters. And so it's it's strange how like the Soviets feel like a bunch of Americans and then you go over to the Afghanistan folks and you know they feel like more natural. So, well, but it's a Hollywood movie. I mean, to be fair, like a decent amount of the civilized world and and Soviet Russia would would have still been civilized, even though you know the Americans didn't think so. They they definitely spoke English. A lot of them had English as a second language. Um, you know, where obviously something like Afghanistan, which is not super civilized, would would not. So that probably where that comes from. Um, second. But, I, especially last week when you announced that you had two movies, I really expected this to be one of them. Yeah. Um, I, I get why you didn't. Um, you know, because the you know comparing the two movies and all that to be in the same battle, but I really either expected this to be the one movie, or when you're like two movies, I was like, oh well, one of them's this, and then you just threw me for a loop. So that's what we do to each other, right? Yeah what we do all right so yeah beast of war definitely check it out and kind of a, a humbling experience is like i'm never out like whenever i'm writing these letterbox reviews i'm never out to like convince people to watch things you know i'm just kind of sharing my experience but um yeah there's a couple people where i was going through um you know uh giving them a like back whenever they liked my beast of war review and i saw that they had a beast of war on um their watch list so i was like ah oh, that's cool to hear that i influenced them <laughs> all right let's get to this uh double feature enemy at the gates is uh up first the plot synopsis for this uh i believe i said earlier this came out in 1999 um a russian and german sniper play a game of cat and mouse during the battle of stalingrad i had not watched this since high school I, since I was like 15, 16, something like that. Hell, maybe 14 if it was 99. Uh, and no, it's 2001 for the record. Gotcha. And uh, yeah, I was surprised that, uh, like, that I still enjoyed it. I didn't think I was going to enjoy it as much having seen so many different kind of movies now um, versus back then. But Okay. Yeah, I'm a sucker for... Um stories about russia so this was right up my alley um i love how like the opening credits kind of have like this faux russian kind of character look because actually i do know what russian characters look like i've you know, traveled there before so they kind of have this kind of faux look to them but i didn't mind it kind of gave it some of an authentic feel to it um we really enjoyed returning to this so let's uh, let's dive right in um it wasn't until I was kind of flipping back through the movie where I see how obvious the foreshadowing is with him, you know, hunting the wolf there at the beginning with, you know, who is uh, the antagonist ends up becoming um, throughout the movie. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, good old um, Ed Harris, right? I think that's his name. Yeah. Badass. Yeah, dude. Great in this role. Dude. Yeah. He, he's always just, oh, you see him. He's like, yep, well, he's the bad guy. Um, yeah, The Rock. For sure. Um, 
Yeah, so this is another, so this is definitely a Hollywood movie. So everyone's speaking English in this, these period piece war films, which, I mean, up until me being a big fan of foreign films just a couple years ago, uh, you know, I, you know, I was savored the fact that, you know, this was all in English. But, um, you know, now it's, you know, it's like, oh, well, typically these movies should uh, what, be in another language, but it's a Hollywood affair, so they're not. But, um, no, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, any feelings? I mean, does that, I know you're a very, you're a purist, but um, what is, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm a purist if it is in a foreign language to Correct. watch it in said language. Like, this is an American movie made for Americans. So, like, yes, they're depicting people in another country, um, you know, people from Russia, people from Germany. But for the most part, I'm fine with it. The only part that I thought was, was real bad, in two parts, I guess, is um, they're having the, the writer guy, like, dictate a letter to the sniper, to Jude Law, and yeah. Jude Law, you know, he, he's supposed to, you know, he's not as smart, he can't read and write as well, so the dude's spelling the word, and he's spelling it in English, and then there's the part where um, Rachel Wise's character is, she's, like, translating, and it's like, but they're, but you're talking in English, and they're talking in English, like, I get it, they're supposed to be talking in Russian, but you're being a code breaker, and you're talking in the same language, um, True. Yeah, a little yeah, bit I mean, of a hiccup there. But I mean, like I get it. It's supposed to be well. They're talking in English to make it easier, but obviously in in the story canonically they're speaking English and uh, I'm sorry, they're speaking Russian and German. I, was, I still always admire how uh, Hunt for the Red October did it, or uh, how Hunt for the Red October started in Russian and then they zoomed up on like Sean Connery's lips and then they zoomed back out and then he's talking in English. To make that little transition so um always kind of uh, admire how that was done so yeah you know if you're traveling around on a train you must be fighting in world war ii yeah probably so that yeah for sure dude what about when they rolled back the 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 regular engine and put like that tank of an engine with like all the mounted machine guns and everything that was that was pretty wild Yep, I love all the um, Soviet uh, set design stuff here. Um, yeah, there's just something about Soviet history and like the whole aesthetic of it has always been real appealing to me. Don't don't let anybody from our state hear you say that. They'll call you a communist. It's funny because um, whenever I was in elementary or uh, middle school, I was a big fan of this uh, computer game called Red Alert, and like my um, there was a thing where you could click on a button and make like the whole like. Um, like all like your your clicker and your like wallpaper all like whatever your favorite team on red alert was and so i had it all soviet decked out and i remember um i was getting my computer worked on and the guy who was working on it knew i was a big red alert fan but apparently somebody else saw it he's like what's this kid doing with all this hammer and sickle stuff all over his computer he's like dude it's a game so um all right so uh i really in a game you can't like the soviets don't you know (laughs) I can tell you. All right. So um, I really love the score to this movie, but did you find anything familiar about the score? I'm going to be real with you. I don't remember a single damn thing about the score. What? Wow. Um, I also, to be fair, I watched this, uh, oh, I guess it was only like four days ago, but no, I don't, I don't remember anything about the score. There is a part of the score that sounds just like Schindler's List, which probably tries to, you know, on purposely evoke, you know, the feeling of a, you know, a great, great, you know, Oscar winning um, war movie. So um, I re- while I really enjoyed the score, I thought it was a little distracting at times of how similar it was to other stuff. Um, well, I mean, you know, that's what way. they do. They just borrow from every movie now. Like there's not, you don't get great, you know, like, um, um, uh, McCone. So not- while I enjoyed it, I, I I definitely felt like it was homage quite a bit. Um, I love when they're explaining like the importance of Stalingrad, how we get that kind of risk style like map of you know like, um, you know the the Nazis you know invading all the way up until but Stalingrad's on the Volga, right? Yeah, on the Volga. Yep. 
Um, awesome, awesome battle right there at the beginning. It has kind of a uh, Saving Private Ryan feel. We are where like the guys are on the boats getting all gunned down from the the planes, and then they have to scramble off the boats in order to uh, kind of get their bearings on them before they head out into all the the gunfire. And poor guys, what one guy gets um, a little packet of ammunition and the other guy gets a gun. How's that supposed to work? Yeah, well, I mean, they had they had more people than they had guns. But the the yeah, that was the thing. The one thing I really remembered about the movie was the beginning, where it was like one guy gets a gun, one guy gets the ammo, and then when they turned around and started retreating because they were just running into a, the German machine guns, then they got gunned down by the Russian machine guns for you know being deserters, and it's like. Kind of the same thing I said in my my review for the other movie was that you know, what choices do you have if you, you know, it's be killed by Russian or, or killed by German? Yeah. Yeah, you feel bad for those guys who like jumped out of the boat and then like the command the Soviet commanders were like shooting them in the back because they're apparently deserting. But I mean, they're in the middle of a darn river. They'll probably drown before they actually get anywhere. Yeah. Um, or freeze. So they finally get to um, yeah the city, and man, it's already like basically rubble. Um, got that big Stalin statue there in the middle of that square. Definitely, I'll let you know that where you're at. You're in Stalingrad. Um, great photography throughout. Um, a lot of like ground level stuff, or like the bits of um, like dirt and stuff fly up on the lens. You know, very Saving Private Ryan esque, but um, you know, done. In a different, a little different setting than that one. So, um, go figure a, a war movie from that time period would try to be like Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> um, huge theme in this movie is um, the news propaganda. So, essentially, it turns after the great opening war sequence, it turns into a, a sniper movie, which is, you know, I would have preferred maybe it was in that whole like, um, war um you know like the different soldiers like going into buildings and stuff but um yeah it being a sniper tale puts a different twist on it a little cat and mouse game like the description said there and then um yeah the propaganda you know this one lone hero you know kind of conquering the nazis on his own kind of thing well yeah and he's just he's built up through the through the propaganda so to compare it to say the last war movie we watched, um, Full Metal Jacket, where you know the the media is portrayed negatively, is you know the, the soldiers think of them negatively because they're portraying them in a bad light, saying that they're losing the war, doing this, that, or the fifth. Here it's like this is we're we're winning because Vasily is you know he's killed eight million German officers. Um, Mm-hmm. So, he's a hell yeah, of a shot. Just, capping yep. that guy in the shower, capping that guy on the run. Yep, he is. A, he's a crack shot. I really enjoy the casting. Jude Law, solid in it. Rachel Wise, really good. Um, but silly, he's awfully modest. Whenever what uh, was it commissar? He's just like, do you know how to shoot? He's just like a little. <laughs> he starts capping people in the head, left and right. Yeah, in very quick succession. Before they've even realized what has happened, basically. So how do you feel about that transition into the, all of a sudden this is going from an all-out war to a sniper story? Like I think that it's... I thought it was very interesting since you had basically this, smoke, this focus on a small group of people within the war. And you still got big battle scenes. You had the one at the beginning. There was a, a one or two more later on. But you just got to see... The, the interaction between people and that is actually what uh, when we get to the next movie like really enjoyed about the the second movie about Stalingrad was it was just this basically this one platoon and you mm-hmm. like the movie you know people talk about the horrors of war and like obviously no movie is ever going to show the true horrors of war but I felt like they tried to do a really good job of that um gotta watch coming to, gotta watch come and see brother Oh, it's on the it's on the list. It's uh in our movie shuffle list. Um, but yeah. and we've hit it a couple. We've hit it once or twice, but you know because it's really long and we'll hit it and it's like ten, ten thirty, and we're like I'm, no. And so one day we're gonna hit oh, it no. in the middle of the day. <laughs> so all right. 
Um, so yeah, I don't think this movie ever quite gets as exciting as what it is in the beginning. But yeah, it, it has some good character stuff being the whole sniper um, game aspect. Great foggy atmosphere throughout. Really enjoyed that. Just the production design in general in this movie is really, really solid in my opinion. Freaking love Bob Hoskins as Nikita Khrushchev. I know you as a history buff probably are aware of um, you know what he would go on to do, right? That's my, I was really big into history in high school. I have, okay. there's so much stuff I've forgotten. So I'm sure that I do, but I just off the top of my head, no. Nikita Khrushchev was the leader of the Soviet Union during, um, after Stalin died and um, he took over and it was during like the period of the um, Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay. So that was Nikita Khrushchev. So yeah, Bob Hoskins being that character is pretty cool. Uh, Stop shooting your pants. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, yeah i guess that wasn't the best impression of the soviet uh commander um man that whenever he is having that lecture in front of like all those troops like did you happen to notice like all the troops are like like ancient <laughs> all the like political officers or whatever is oh, like yeah. how are we going to spin this well yeah because they're all they're all like high-ranking officers so yeah they're typically older um a bit of a love triangle in it in this which i'm not really a fan of but um i guess that didn't really bother me because the rachel weiss character really didn't give the uh his name's com commissar it must be his position right or is that his name yeah i think that's his position yeah. um but i i, I don't even like to say love triangle because she wasn't into him she was like into vasily and he yeah. was into her and then just the, the best friend was just jealous that you know, he, he wanted to be with her and so yeah, one side happy. one sided. I mean I it's still definitely a triangle, but um yeah, he definitely doesn't get the love he wants, which makes him have quite the stink face towards the end. He, yeah, <laughs> makes him makes him write that really seething article. So. Yeah, calling his best friend. Oh my goodness. Check out how podcasting late at night. That's that's what'll do to you. All right. Uh -huh. Um yeah, so Ed Harris comes into picture. Um, we had mentioned earlier, yeah, he's a complete badass. Um, yeah, really marvel at this whole set design. Like, I mean, when a lot of these scenes, you're seeing these guys sitting in, in like foxholes, and it's like super wet and cold looking. So I love how it really captures that atmosphere. Yeah, and it's back before a lot of that stuff would have been CGI. So. At times, I kind of looked, and it kind of looked like some of the smoke might have been computer generated at times, but I'm not really picky about all that, but it was just an observation. Um, you got the whole dumbass kid, Sasha, and like, I mean, if I was really thinking critically on this film, I mean, I love this film a lot, so I'm only like, whenever I mention stuff like this, I'm kind of nitpicking. Um, so the kid is kind of a, um, a, a plot device, um, you know, to bring the enemy sniper kind of into the realm of, um, you know, what Vasily might be thinking, but you know, he's playing double agent, which is a dangerous game. Oh yeah. So this is a dangerous game. The whole country is looking at you, Vasily. Yeah. When he goes to that party there and he looks up at the big, uh, Stalin picture, it's probably a good idea that they didn't, they just left Stalin as this, a portrait in this movie instead of trying to like have some random actor try to play him. Death of Stalin's a really good uh, satire that came out a couple years ago. Um, if you want a, a dark humor about um, the Soviet Union. Okay, I mean I like some dark humor, and I like I like a good satire, so I'll keep that in mind. Um, okay, then we find out that okay, so then it, what? It flashes back to the beginning and shows that he wasn't actually the Stone Cold Killer, like he might have been made out to be because he didn't have he didn't have the um you know the gumption to uh kill that wolf before it uh jumped on the horse that his grandfather left out for bait so we yep. kind of see a little bit of a vulnerability um in him coming into the second half of the movie and then we get to see my what is probably one of my one of my favorite parts of this movie that i motherfucking that I ron perlman to... yeah so i'm re this fucking Sons steel teeth so I'm, I'm rewatching Sons of Anarchy for the millionth time, I, I, whatever. And, you know, he's like one of the main characters in the show. And so they show him first sitting and they're kind of panned out from him and he's got the, the cap on. And I'm like, what the fuck is Clay Morrow doing in this fucking movie? And um, 
and then sure enough, it was it was Ron Perlman, and then, dude, he got domed while jumping, just, just, and that also shows Ed, Ed Harris, you know, didn't go for the bait. They took his bait. He didn't take their bait, and then just, oh, they're over here. Oh, this is where they're gonna be, and just. Yeah, that was awesome how, yeah, he set it up to where, yeah, he poked the head up, but, yeah, Ed Harris didn't take the bait, and exactly, he got capped while, while, in, while running and jumping at the same time. Pretty, pretty badass. Yeah, I mean, they, he, I mean, in the first thing before you see him, and uh, he kills a couple of the other members, like, he did the same thing. They shot a, a helmet that was on a um, mannequin, but was just propped up outside, and yeah, and apparently the Ron Perlman character like went through this um, this guy's school of like sniping. So like he gives Vasily a lot of great insights into how he works, but ultimately he's not he's not there for too long. But he he definitely um, makes an impression while he is there. Yeah, for sure. I mean Ron Ron Perlman with just the way he looks and you know his whole demeanor and everything, he just kind of commands the screen. Um, so. Great set piece whenever they're like sneaking into the factory there and like you can actually see people like, you know, scuffling through like the um, pipes because, um, you know, they're, they're kind of dusty or whatever. And so it ends up being a trap where what Vasily gets kind of stuck there behind a um, like a stove or whatever. And, you know, he has him in, you know, he has him right there and what Rachel Wise has to come and there's this whole thing with like glass falling and you can see the reflection and. And they blind him and stuff to get out of there. So, really cool set piece there. That that was definitely a tension filled moment. I mean, definitely a lot of tension filled moments throughout this. There's that scene where him and the one guy go in the building and they see a lot like Ed Harris's cigarette cigarettes there, still warm, and they set the trap for him. But you know that the sniper game it's it's a waiting game. So you're not always going to be there anymore. So uh, a lot of good tension throughout in that, in that aspect. Yeah, no, that's, that's the, the movie built built tension really well, and I, I think I actually maybe enjoyed that more than the big war pieces. I mean, the war pieces were good. I think I just enjoyed the the tension more. All right, um, and man, the, did you like the love scene? I thought it was pretty raw and steamy, and I I was into it. I mean, yeah, like I mean, sometimes you got to do what you got to do, and if you're in a barracks full of a bunch of dudes, I mean, you just gotta go for it sometimes yeah i thought it was hot um i mean despite yeah the not this most um romantic circumstances but yeah i really dug the love story in this um yeah his buddy the commissar he knows pretty quick i mean he's trying to what get uh the rachel weiss character to like you know go be what an interpreter or whatever so um she's out of yeah, harm's way but she wants to be right there with Vasily shooting people so um Yep, fast forwarding a little bit. Um, you got the Sasha character. You know he's you know he's playing both sides, and you can tell Ed Harris now he's on to him. And um, yeah, little uh, he's like, please do not come out again. And he comes out again, and his ass gets hung. So I was pretty brutal. Yeah, um, hanging a kid is pretty brutal. <laughs> yeah, there's no. And, you know, that obviously everyone gets angry and pissed and... Yep, Rachel uh, has her old... The Rachel Wise character kind of has her freak out and she wants to go get him. And then... But she kind of gets taken out of commission, yeah. By, um... But they're helping Sasha's mom get on the boat and she gets hit, hit by, like, a random bomb. And so, like, yeah, we, think she gets... we think she's dead for a little while. Yeah, she gets she gets caught in the shrapnel and uh, the, the lie they tell the mom is, oh, you went over to the Germans... As opposed to, yeah, he got hung. So, you know, some some compassion, I guess. Reminds me of Ivan's childhood a little bit. Nothing. Sure, we'll go with that. I, okay. Oh, I, I just, I, um, I don't, I'm sure you remember my opinions on both Army of Shadows and Ivan's Shadow, and I just tried to erase them from my memory. Oh, Kyle, it wasn't that bad. Um... I mean, oh, they were both near the bottom of my movie my movie list those year, that year. Oh, that's unfair. All right, moving no, on. No, that's just my opinion. Beautiful You're movie. unfair, you jerk. <laughs> so what Vin Diesel movie did you watch this week? 
Actually, I watched about 17 Vin Diesel movies this week. 17, is uh, that right? <laughs> yeah, I watched 17. I watched the, all nine Fast and the Furious movies, um, the three Pitch Black movies, um, the one where, like, the Guardians Pacifier. of the Galaxy 1 and 2. Uh, I mean, I was going to leave those out until I didn't need to. We got the Pacifiers, that's 13. What what else? Uh, Bloodline. Oh, there's some movie where he's like. Was it Blood Rain? No, I don't think he's in Blood Rain. Um, but there's some movie where he's like a big giant witch nerd thing. I watched that too. Yeah. All right, All right. you you. Di- I I officially declare it. You you digress. Um. You're, look, motherfucker. You're the one who started this. You. I'm just saying there's a similarity with a little kid in war at war and, you know, getting killed by the, the Nazis. So I was just well, making that comparison. The Nazis killed killed innocents. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> Sons of bitches. All right. I'm just pointing out a similarity. All I got right. you. No, that's fair. I just, I wiped that movie from my memory. <laughs> Roger that. Um... Yeah, I thought the commissar, like, he's hanging out with Vasily, and he's just like, all right, I'm going to show you where he is, and he jumps up, and he gets capped in the head, and that was a little bit Hollywood. Um, I mean, decent sacrifice, but, I mean, I don't know. Did, did, you, did you get that same vibe, or did you, were you feeling it? I mean, it's just, it seemed a lot, like, he felt bad, I guess, for writing, you know, that Vasily was some sort of traitor or whatever, but it's like, I don't think you have to just die and i guess you know he's sad because he thinks homegirl is dead yeah but i think that's yeah i will say hollywood i was gonna say dramatic but hollywood fits you know the hollywood drama all right so we're we're syncing up yeah we're syncing up now we're syncing up now um so yeah uh, ed harris he's just like oh i got him let me go let me go scope this out and he he glances over there on the train tracks and um jude law got him in his crosshairs and he's toast nice slaw drawn out drawn out moment and cap he's dead um kind of remind me americans this ending obviously i guess american sniper being the other big sniper movie i guess so that's actually what i need to see um but i do i do like you know like he turns and kind of looks at him and acknowledges hey you got the best of me right as he gets capped into capped into head so Yep. So yay, a happy ending. He uh, the 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 war's over, and he discovers his girlfriend there. You know, healing up, and so hooray, happy ending. Um, it was a happy ending. I'm I, that last scene. I'm not a huge fan of because it's like I would have liked to see them like more close up. Or I mean, I guess since we were already being Hollywood, we can be really Hollywood, and you know, they can see each other for the first time in a couple of months, and they have you know, a big kiss or something as opposed to they're just zooming out on the fucking hospital. But, I mean, that's a very small gripe, so whatever. And then, um, enjoyed the, uh, really enjoyed the, um, the closing credits there where it kind of has that, um, you know, that European sounding kind of Jewishy kind of music. Um, um, and then you see, yeah, you have the little shots of the characters again and, yeah, I just love the whole feel of this movie. Um, overall, I really enjoyed the... I mean, some people uh, like, let's see, Pearl Harbor is the standard for like um, inserting a romance into you know a war story that really doesn't need to be there. But um, you know, I enjoyed that whole aspect of this one quite a bit. I think this movie did that a lot better because you also... Like, this just felt like it was part of this movie, whereas Pearl Harbor felt like we're going to take a war movie... And like a romantic drama and smash them together. Yeah. And then it's like two and a half, three hours long or whatever, which is fine. War movies are typically long, but it just, it felt like there was too much to it in that movie, I guess. I'd really like to give this movie five stars, but I would settle at four and a half just because, I mean, those are, there are some pretty heavy handed plot device devices that work here that are pretty apparent so i can't say it's flawless but man i enjoy the hell out of it i gave it three and a half i i also really enjoyed it um i don't know what i mean i I enjoyed it i don't think i enjoyed it as much as you and 
So I just, yeah, three and a half. I thought it was a very solid movie, very good. Definitely would not be opposed to at some point watching it again. Now into the second half of our double bill for uh, war movies. And I thought it'd be a really interesting comparison to actually do more of a Hollywood movie and then a um, you know a European take, a German language movie on the same battle. So kind of where the... I heard about the movie Stalingrad from 1993 is I watched All Quiet on the Western Front. And I thought that was a really interesting show, um, early Best Picture winner. And it was from the German perspective. And I thought that was pretty neat. But obviously in that movie, like, all the Germans kind of felt like Americans because it was all in English. And uh, you, you know, just kind of noted how it was interesting getting, you know, like a German perspective on the war because... In most movies, I mean, you know, the Nazis are always the bad guys. So I had kind of floated that out there, and um, our buddy Max um, is like, hey, here's a whole cool list of, um, you know, German war movies, you know, give you the other side of the story. And so this was actually at the top of the list, and um, yeah, I was excited to dive in, and it, boy, was it worth it. So um, plot synopsis, the story follows a group of German soldiers from their Italian rest and relaxation in the summer of 1942 to the frozen steeps of Soviet Russia and ending with the battle for Stalingrad. That's not exactly accurate. The, the battle for Stalingrad is kind of in the middle and it kind of like peters out towards the end, but uh, we'll get there. <clears throat> so initial thoughts on Stalingrad. I, I'm not going to lie. I enjoyed it more than I thought I was going to. Um, seeing as the other war movies that weren't Hollywood war movies that you have picked, I have not enjoyed as per our conversation a little while ago. Oh, like Army of Shadows and Ivan's Childhood and list goes on yeah. and on, right? Yeah, those, the, well, I think it was those two. Those were the two main ones. But okay. anywho, um, I, the humanity... And them showing, like, how the war was affecting them, mm -hmm. I thought was way more interesting than any of, like, the battles or anything like that. There was the one battle that was super dope, but we can get there. Um, two, ba two super dope battles. Like, them, yeah. th them in the city, and then the tank one, right? The tank one. Oh, my God, the tank one. And the, the, the one in the city, is that uh, the... the I mean, like, what? When they first get there and they're storming like the factory or whatever, and it like shows them what like on ground level, then in the factory, and it like takes it's like this whole progression of a battle, which was cool to see play out. I I enjoyed the tank one more more like. Okay. Yeah, I once we got into past that battle that you were talking about and started showing the effects of everything on them, I was that's when I got much more intrigued into the movie. But yeah, it was cool to see the movie. I mean, like the opposite of book ended. I mean, what they're out in the the beach on a, in a town in Italy at the beginning, you know, just relaxing, and then they're freezing to death at the end. Um, so definitely quite the opposite journey. Um, yeah, it's just interesting, like because all quiet on the Western Front. That's like um, Germany, World War One. So, I mean, I really can't think of any other World War II movies I've seen where, you know, we're following, you know, Nazis the whole time. And it's really cool to see, like, you know, from a perspective of the guys, you know, in the boots fighting in the war, you know, we're all human. Well, and, and also, you know, from, from our perspective, we call all of them Nazis. And... They were part of the Nazi army, part of the Nazi regime. But you remember the one captain was like, I'm not a Nazi. Um, the, the one with the wooden hand, he's, he tells them while they're, I guess, in Siberia, you know, I'm not a Nazi. So, you know, he hadn't been part of the Nazi party. Definitely those soldiers and how they're per portrayed, you wouldn't think of, of how America, especially in movies, portray Nazis. I mean, um, so know, easily, like, from the Indiana Jones movies to 
Um, you know, so many instances, you know, Nazis are just the stereotypical bad guy. So to actually follow them around and see their humanity was a really cool um, kind of different flavor for this movie for sure. And it's got great action throughout, great um, interpersonal stories as we follow this group of soldiers throughout this hell. Um, so we had already mentioned the, um, the great battle sequence in the, um, the town of Stalingrad which was very similar looking to what we saw in uh, Enemy at the Gates. Um, get the great shots of like the cost of war with all the, the bodies, um, you know, strewn across the, um, you know, the, the dirt there. Um, one of the, when I was flipping back through it, one of the scenes that grabbed me again was um, the truth sequence where um, truce where what they wave the white flag and they're like, Hey, let's, Let's chill out for a second and, you know, stop shooting each other. And then one of the ones, one of the guys gets like gung-ho and breaks the truce or whatever and messes that up. But, um, have you ever seen the, um, the Civil War movies, uh, Gods and Generals and, um, Gettysburg? I have not seen actually either one of those. I don't, I haven't seen very many, like, Civil War movies other than, you know, like, some Westerns that, you know, oh, this is happening during the Civil War kind okay. of thing. But actual Civil War movies, now I haven't really seen very many. It reminds me of this moment from Gods and Generals where, like, you know, there's the, 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 the Yankees guys camping and then the Rebels camping and they just kind of come up on each other. It's like, hey, Johnny Reb, hey, um, you know, Billy Yank, and, you know, they just talk like regular human beings. I mean not during the actual battle. So it's kind of cool to see that, you know, people can be civil to each other when they're not, um, you know, in the heat of battle sometimes. So we get a little bit of that. Well, yeah, because it just, it comes down to the soldiers are the ones fighting, but, you know, they they may not have a real reason to hate these other people, or at least once they're battling, they understand. Whereas, you know, policy is, well, don't do this. You can't, if, if you do anything that helps uh a Bolshevik in this case, and you're, you know, a deserter, you're a traitor, or as I kept calling him, a Soviet sympathizer um, right. in the movie. So, you know, while they're all, you know, living in decadent houses and have all the food and supplies they want, and they're just spitting their rhetoric out. So I'll be really interested to see this again in a couple years. Um, Cause knowing the story now, I could really get more settled in with what some of the dialogue and so flipping back through this, obviously I'm not reading through all the subtitles again, but yeah, there are so many great moments um, of the guys like talking. I, I remember distinctly the scene of the guy getting really upset where he finds out his uh, wife is messing around well with a French guy. He's like, gosh, we conquered them in days. And now, you know, my wife's lost to this Frenchie. And um, especially that moment in the back of the truck where they're singing, oh, Christmas tree, because I recognize that in German, and so that was really cool to hear. Um, so very human moments throughout this whole thing. Um, you know, anti-war film, basically the cost, but you know, it definitely shows the um, some great action in it too. So it's it's very balanced in that perspective. Oh yeah, no, they 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 definitely balance out. You know, the, the big action set pieces with you know slowing it down and you know having your your dialogue and your plot and your story and all that good stuff. Now, the one thing I get hung up about with Saving Private Ryan is there's that scene in the church where they're all shooting the shit or whatever, getting to know each, getting to know each other. And for me, that scene, it's like you have all this great action and then all of a sudden, like, nothing for this span of time where they're talking to each other, where I felt like it was much more naturally integrated into this movie, between breaking up the action and, the, like, the more personal moments. So I definitely preferred this one over Saving Private Ryan in that um, perspective it's been so long since i've seen that movie like it's that's that's definitely one that's due for a, a rewatch i probably haven't seen that since i was either a teenager or like my early 20s so a lot of cool set pieces here like i mentioned they're kind of in the middle of stalingrad the city um they're in that building they're down in the sewers and then later on and they're in the snow so i i really enjoyed how the fact that it wasn't the same monotonous like battle the whole time it definitely it felt like it spanned the whole um gap of the battle there and then yeah in the sewers where uh we meet the the russian female soldier sympathizer well we later on we find out she's a sympathizer right 
I believe so. But yeah, she's a. Uh, you know, she uh, knocks the the lieutenant down into the sewers to get away because she thinks he's going to kill her, and mm-hmm. that becomes important later on. A lot of gritty scenes here. There's a guy about to lose his leg, so they take out what a jackknife and finish off the amputation. That's pretty. Ooh, kind of gives you the shivers seeing stuff like that. And um, mm-hmm. see someone they just in the background. They've got a hacksaw just going to town. Yep, very bloody. Um, so yeah, this is a movie where you could definitely like feel the cold because they kind of flash forward to kind of like the Nazis kind of retreating the Stalingrad area and you know basically freezing to death and being stuck in this Arctic hell. Um, oh well, they remember they got in trouble for forcing a doctor to help their their buddy, and so like they are they're prisoners and sent to like Siberia to look up mines in the snow, right? Or okay. Find the mines in the snow. Yep, I do remember that scene. Okay, so they got in trouble. Didn't piece that together quite as cleanly as what you described, but um, that makes sense quite a bit. Yeah, because because the captain comes to him, and that's when they do the thing where he's like, "I'm not a Nazi." But he also tells them, hey, you know, we're going to do, we, we need you guys back on the front line. And if you get through this battle, you'll be reinstated. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised how much of the movie actually does take place out in the winter hell. Um, that's where we get that awesome tank sequence you were talking about where they're, you know, within the foxholes and then the, the tanks spot them and great mo- moment there. Yeah. Just the, and, you know, seeing how it's like, we're not in tanks, but this is how we're going to fight the tanks. I um, mean, and, and fight the, the you know the rush the Soviet soldiers jumping off the tanks and stuff, and you know you get the blood against the snow, and you know all of that pops, and mm-hmm. it's just yeah, it was just a real really good battle scene. It's cool how like they're kind of they're still wearing their German uniforms, but they kind of have these like white like stuff like tied to them to kind of camouflage them a little bit against the snow. I think. Yeah, they got looks like plastic or something. Yeah, it might be the waterproofing, right? Yeah. Yeah. True. Um, This movie reminded me a lot of this movie I saw recently from the Criterion Collection, um, The Ascent. The Ascent is about some Soviets who get um, basically um, separated from their forces and they end up, you know, with the Germans and stuff. So it had a very similar feel to the end of this movie. I like this one a lot better because it... I thought it had good action scenes throughout where the ascent, it was a good action scene in the beginning, and then it was just kind of metaphorical, like, stuff throughout the, um, and more like the cost of war to, to finish out. So, um, just want to throw that out there for people that have seen the ascent. Um, this is actually where the, the old Christmas tree scene comes up, um, don't, I was really I was surprised we didn't spend as much time in the city of Stalingrad. It was pretty much just that middle uh, part of the film, and then we get sent out to what Siberia, like you said. Yeah, and then you know, then I guess then on the outskirts because they come back to the front line, and it's just it's just winter. I don't know how far Stalingrad and on the Volga, you know, how far away they really went, but. Um, but yeah, then it's just the harsh Russian winter. So we're probably like not that far from Stalingrad at that point, but Yep. And uh, what is it what history tells us like Napoleon could have um uh, any army could have conquered Russia if it, you know, if it didn't, you know, the battle didn't bleed into the winter time whenever everybody gets totally frozen to death. So Yeah, and I mean makes and things they hard. showed, you know, where cars were just frozen like, cause, you know, the oil in the tanks and stuff were freezing. That's how cold it was. And so, yeah, it's much different, you know, because they also, you know, they didn't really show it in either of the movies. But, you know, one of the things that history has taught us is they used the, the, the turn and burn or scorch the earth, basically, where yep. they're just burning the fields as they retreat back and back and back. Cause they've got so much ground to give. And now, yep. the, you know, the enemies can't live off of their land. And, Yep, very good point, Joey. Um, some more interpersonal moments with the soldiers. Uh, we see the one guy get trench foot, which is pretty nasty. Um, we see that one asshole commander. What don't they get like the rations sent 
the rations and some metal sent to them in like a little tube sent from a, a plane. And then so they enjoy that. And then the, the commander comes up. He's just like, what are you doing? And they end up having to kill his ass because he was a jerk off. Yeah, and he, he shot one of the other ones. Yep. Yep. And then that's when they find the big, the big house he had been staying in that had all the supplies. Right, right. And then uh, one of them and, goes a the little girl. nutty. Yep. And he ends up killing Valentine's. himself. Hmm? Yeah, because they find the, the girl who had knocked the lieutenant. Uh, she's chained to a bed. And then, of course, they're like, we'll do it by rank. So, lieutenant, you go first. You know, obviously, you know, talking about raping her. Right. And to which he unties her and she's, you know, she gets mad. Oh, I'm not as pretty as your, as your German women. And they kind of fight back and forth. And, mm -hmm. and he's just like, yeah, no one, no one's touching her. I'm like, no. Yep. And then, um, well, they got to get the heck out of there because they're going to get captured. And so they end up out in the snow and she gets shot and killed. And yeah, they end up getting huddled out in the middle of, um, blizzard together reminiscing about better days and, and they freeze to death and it's a kind of a sad end to the story yeah, it's a very bleak ending and like i mean it fits the movie I, obviously like oh yes it fits so thus I, I like it because it fits but you know at the same time you watch this movie with these two people struggling so hard to get out of that situation mm -hmm. um barely missing that plane yeah that scene was crazy. Everyone trying to get out and they, you know, they couldn't find another way out other than, you know, they just, they got out because they died, but you know, you're yeah. kind of hoping that they might make it back to, you know, back to Germany somehow or somewhere, mm -hmm. even though, you know, they're supposed to be the bad guys because they're Nazis, but yeah. Whew. So what would we rate this guy? Um, I'd probably go four and a half on this one as well. Um, especially re kind of re flipping through it, really put all the, the human moments back into perspective, which I really appreciate great action throughout. And um, yeah, I'm so glad that Max brought this one to my attention. Um, could go as high as five on a rewatch. Maybe I gave it four and I'm, I might, you know, if I ever were to rewatch it and I would have no issue rewatching it. Um, it, like I said, I gave it four. I could see myself going higher potentially. Um, it was very enjoyable. Um, I know, obviously a different style than than the first one here. Um, you know, it's yeah. not Hollywood, so it didn't have the real the intrusive same, score or the um, like the same. I mean, it had big action plot devices, but, but it, yeah, it was a little bit different. I mean, which is sometimes why we enjoy those movies. Yep. All right. So right after the break, we'll be talking about an all-time classic that me and Joey probably have quite different opinions on. See you then. And we're back. Talking about the Maltese Falcon. This was on Joey's Wheel of Destiny list. I've wanted to see this for quite a while. It's on that... AFI greatest movies of all time list. What are the original noirs? Humphrey Bogart, the most amazing film ever. We'll find out. Um, a private detective takes on a case that involves him with three eccentric criminals, a gorgeous liar, really? Okay. And their quest for a priceless statuette. I, after. I knew for sure Joey was going to love this to pieces, and then I was confirmed whenever I saw his big uh, ratings drop there. But, Joey, tell us about your feelings about the Maltese Well. All right, so this is going to be my, my third bogey movie. Uh, it's my third one that has hit very, very, very high in my movie list for the year. Now, it's still April... It's still a long time. I feel like this one's still going to end up in my, my top five. Um, but yeah, no, Bogey, the movie could be, itself could be shit, and Bogey could just drag it up a star or two by himself in everything that I've seen so far. That's just... I agree with that. Yeah. So, I don't think I liked it near as much as, as Blanca or Brina, but it it was it was hella good and I'm 
I'm a little disappointed in you. My hot take after watching it the first time, if I were to post a right to Letterbox, I would have said, blah, 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 the Maltese Falcon, blah, 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 blah. Because these people like to talk and talk and talk. There's some great characters. There's some great sharp dialogue. But oh my God, it goes on forever. So did you not like Casablanca? Uh, there's some stakes in there with the whole Nazis and stuff. Um, let's not compare this to Casablanca right now. Come well, on, but, we're talking about the Maltese The Falcon. reason that I'm saying that is that's another movie where they talk a lot and not a lot happens, but a lot happens without a lot happening. So that's that's where I was going with that. Okay. I mean, obviously, there are different okay. styles okay. of movies. Okay, let me like, break this down. Okay, this is a murder mystery. And from square one of this lady coming in and bitching to Sam Spade about, oh, my sister went missing because she went off with this guy. Yeah, I don't care. So that's that's part one. God, the melodrama between Spade and his uh, Sam Spade and his women. I'm just like, oh, God, don't care. So those are two big, huge... Um, wrenches in the in the scenario so, so do, do does somebody have to like be freezing and be like dirty and grimy and fucking in a platoon full of uh soldiers for you to be interested in a in a plot between men and women i did like enemy at the gates i sure did mm-hmm. <laughs> no i'm just saying you were like that that scene was all hot and steamy and the only thing i could think was it was like can you imagine how bad they smell like Obviously, <laughs> obviously. Did you think? Times, did you think the femme fatale in this was hot? Not particularly. No, I, I don't get it. I mean, you see all this stuff but, about her being gorgeous and a and a showstopper. No, I didn't think so. Okay, she but not I mean, put Marilyn about, Monroe in that position, and we're, that's a whole different movie. I think we're putting Marilyn Monroe in that position. She's a child, but oh, don't be so literal on me, Mister. Oh, no. Okay, fair. I get what you're saying, but also we're talking from like 1940s standards, not like 1960s standards, because I think it is 20 years later where we see her in a John Huston movie for the first time. So. Is Marilyn Monroe in a John Huston movie? I believe so. I believe, and I believe I own it. Um, what is, is it? in the Criterion collection and the oh, name is it Asphalt, Dun- Jun- Asphalt that Jungle? Asphalt Jungle, that's the one. Oh, I didn't know that was a John Huston flick. I, then this I, was I, and I, this and this Maltese Falcon. I this was uh, John Huston's first flick, right? Uh, I didn't know if it was his first movie, but um, I believe so. Drop a little trivia on your ass. Yeah, you did. Look at that. Yes, he did in fact do the Asphalt Jungle and the Maltese Falcon. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Cool to know. All right. Um, so right after being kind of underwhelmed by this, I watched um, the Angry Video Game Nerds review of it. Um, I'm blanking on his uh, his real name. But um, yeah, he was saying how this is one of his favorite movies. And the first time he watched it, he wasn't really into it. But um, he kind of noted like, you know, Spade's character being really cool. And like the sharp dialogue, which is I do credit this movie for having so i ended up watching this twice um the second one i was kind of working and kind of listening to it and i definitely was picking up more on the dialogue appreciating that more but yeah those those points that i note i noted about the melodrama and the murder mystery thing are still stuff that really drag it down for me although it did go up a little bit higher in my book oh yeah no i just from from the gun i was i was hooked in following what was going on like i said bo bogey isn't i i'm just gonna have to watch more of his movies like i've seen three and like i've only watched like one a year i think because i think i watched blanca in 18 and then i watched uh you watch, of last year you gotta watch treasure sin Cien- madre that's his actual best movie I mean, maybe so. I'll, I mean, I, I want to watch more of his movies, so that, that's going to happen. But yeah, no. It's just, African Queen's good, too. I've, I've heard. I've heard all of these movies are good. And since, you know, to shout out Carl here, I had never seen a, a movie prior to 1975 um, that mostly was not Disney movies <laughs> until uh-huh. I moved in with him. Uh-huh. And we looked through it the other day, and it was, it was 
pretty accurate. There was a couple here and there. But he did have to change it from 80 to 75 because I, you know, caught up a little bit. Okay. Um, Definitely get the uh, atmosphere of San Francisco off the top, seeing with the Golden Gate Bridge and stuff, with that being the setting. But after that, it's pretty much all interior. So you don't get much of the city after, you know, the opening little montage there. Um, Yeah, like I mentioned, Lady comes in wanting to talk to Spade about tracking down her sister, but okay, let's think about this for a second. So the whole reason she really came in there was to get Spade to be like the in-between man between her and Gutman in regards to this priceless Maltese Falcon, right? Yes, that is what it ends up, you find out it ends up being is that she needed some basically new protection kind of thing, someone to shield her from the other people all right um i heard a lot of people mention how wonderful the shadows are in this um i guess film noir by definition is like a dark movie it really um one of the tropes of it is you know all the great cinematography in the shadows so i think mostly i didn't really find on overall many scenes really standing out to me being cool with the shadows but um the whole uh spade and whatever his partner's name was whenever it like show like the, the light shone through the window and showed like the name of their office on the ground i thought that was really cool yeah that was that was that was a really good shot that like as far as shots go that's the only one i can really like pick out but i just the ending is what really did it for me where just bogey just fucking outsmarts everybody like this hmm. and then you know that he's a smooth talker the whole time almost to the yeah to the point of it's like is he actually a bad guy like <laughs> so yeah, he's pretty pretty snide um so his partner ends up dead um he finds out he's pretty unremorseful about it since he was shacking up with his partner's lady which man oh my I mean, the femme fatale is a little dramatic, but oh my gosh, his uh, partner's widow is like, oh my gosh, blah, blah, blah. Look, who would be real? The real the real best female character in the movie was the secretary. Yeah, the she, assistant she was, was badass. Yeah, the she blonde. was the goat. <laughs> um, so yeah, Sam is suspected in the murder. Um, the cops come and talk to him. You know, he's smooth. Like, one of the guys likes him. One of the cops likes him. One of them doesn't. But, um, he can talk his way out of pretty much any situation. Shoot, he can even be like, hey, how much money you got? $500? All right, you give me all that. But what am I going to have to live on? Uh, well, pawn Here's your stuff. Here's a $20 bill. No, he doesn't do he that. Gets... He makes her pawn her shit. No, but when he, he takes all the money from her, he takes, like, a bill and gives it back to her. Oh, does he's he? He's like, yeah... But yeah, he does sell it. Hawk your shit, baby. And then, oh, here's like 20 bucks. I'm a, I'm a benevolent god. <laughs> yeah, you uh, yeah, um, definitely hit the nail on the head for me there with the assistant being awesome. Like, throughout, he's always calling her like an angel, calling her like all these nice little, um, what's the names? Like, just pet little names. pet names, exactly. And then towards the end, he's just like, man, you're a great guy or whatever. Like, he like gives her the same respect as one of the dudes. Towards the end, I believe. Yeah, I mean, well, he doesn't do anything. Like, he, he's not who he is without her, so. Yep, and um, it's interesting because he's always coming up with ways of how he's going to spin the story to the cops. So he's always, like, telling her exactly, like, okay, it didn't happen this way, it happened that way, or whatever. You don't know this, but I know this kind of stuff. So, yeah, he's definitely um, thinking a few steps ahead. So, great, great character, for sure. Um... Not so much for the Fem Fatale, which she keeps lying to him throughout the whole thing. Now, one thing I thought was bullshit was, so she comes back and is like, yeah, I was lying about like my sister and blah, blah, blah. He's like, yeah, I knew that, but I didn't really care. You paid us enough money. I'm like, did you know that? I don't buy it, but whatever. I mean, he, but he's believe a whatever. smooth talker. Yeah, believe that so whatever just, Spade says. Yeah, I mean, if you remember when he gets to the end and he's like, some of this is just uh you know it makes business easy so it's it, it's definitely part of his i'm i'm good but i'm not good 
not 100% good persona. He's like, I'm, I'm willing to be dirty if I have to. And then, you know, you find out he's probably not actually as dirty as you think he is. And what's next? Oh, Peter Lorre. He's um, another great actor in this movie. Now, whenever you finally watch M, you'll become quite familiar with uh, Peter Lorre. Uh, kind of this bug-eyed actor. Um, it's funny I mention him now because he his um, I was watching a uh, Looney Tunes cartoon where they actually did a uh, a caricature of Peter Lorre in that one, so it was cool. Um, he reminded me a lot of the um, you know the Nazi with the glasses in um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. With his little cane or whatever. So um, yeah, he's a great character in this. Um, I was listening to some extra, like, um, commentary about this movie, and apparently he's supposed to be gay. I mean, he does act a little quirky. I mean, whatever, whatever that, um, you know, whatever bearing that has, but, uh, I just want to throw it out there. All right. Okay. <laughs> apparently, um, I need, I should probably listen back to, because apparently the, the music that plays whenever he comes in is a little, uh little um flippant i guess would be the word i would want to use there um so yeah i mean he's a little quirky so kind of goes with it it's it's fun how spade really bullies him and um gutman's a uh, little short um henchman dude taking uh taking their guns from them pretty easily oh yeah the dude just when he like guts the one guy getting in front of him and just pulls the Pulls both the guns out of his pocket. And it's like, was this dude in, from the future from a John Woo movie with the double pistols? <laughs> and then so with the femme fatale comes and, you know, she's being a little bit more honest with him now. But she's real nervous about the situation and keeps tightening up the the apartment and poking at the fire or whatever. And he's just like, all right, you're, I can see that you're nervous or whatever. So chill out, Bogey says. Um, I think that's the moment where he takes all her money. Maybe they're in the apartment and yeah, there's a lot of talking scenes in this movie. Um, I mean, yes, there is a lot of talking in this movie. And then Peter Lorre, um, the three of them get together and um, you know they're. I love it's it's a great moment whenever when he starts slapping Peter Lorre and just like you're gonna you're gonna take this and you're gonna like it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean you don't fuck with you don't fuck with Bogey. That's that's what we have learned. Um, and so he goes and answers the, the, the door for the cops and, and, uh, I guess she goes and attacks Peter Laurie's character. And so I'm like, what is all that commotion? And they go and check it out and break it up. <sighs> um, yep. She has, she definitely has a feisty side. Uh, okay. So now let's get to Casper Gutman and what a, that's a hell of a last name for a hell of a, a rotund man, huh? Yeah. He's, and especially like back then, like seen someone that big he's definitely would have been the fat man like <laughs> for sure it's funny where um like bogey wants to find out what exactly they're dealing with with this multi fal multi falcon and and so he's like you need to tell me what it is and they're like oh but you have to give us something first and then he's like starts yelling at him and storms off and gives him like this ultimatum and then he gets to the elevator and he starts smiling being like i bet they bought that <laughs> so you really tell that you know he's a he has a good poker face. He's a he's a master manipulator, as one would say. What's up with those shots from uh, Gutman's crotch? Like we're looking up at Gutman, but like the camera's like right in his like in between his legs almost. It's just like, huh? I'm not really sure if they I want to be looking at this guy this way. They they want you to know that he's he's the guy with the big dick swinging that you don't fuck with him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't I don't know. I'm just like. Um, he comes back and, um, he finally tells Bogey all about this, this bird. Now, I thought this was supposed to be, like, one of the most famous MacGuffins in all of history. And with a MacGuffin, by principle, we're not supposed to know a whole lot about it. But we get this whole, like, backstory about pirates and this, this damn bird. Um, I, I mean, coming into this, I thought 
this bird was gonna be a whole lot more interesting than it was, but it's kind of tacked on. Am I wrong? Uh, I mean, I thought the the whole aspect of trying to find this ridiculous piece of treasure was really cool, and then the fact that you know he's chased it from this place to this place, and it was gone for hundreds of years, and yeah. So I thought it was interesting. Also, how the fuck can you say it's tacked on? It's the name of the movie. But it doesn't really come into play until like the third act. Well, yes, because you've been building to it. It's the whole movie is subterfuge. Like, that's fair. Subterfuge. That's a that's a two dollar word. Yeah. <laughs> subterfuge. What did you say earlier about Bugs Bunny? He's a. Um, Oh, I said he was sentient, but I meant to say humanoid <laughs> rabbit is what I meant to say. And that's why I corrected myself, because rabbits are obviously sentient creatures anyway. Gotcha. But. All right. So, um, yeah, after they tell him all about the Maltese Falcon, they drug his ass. And um, that's when the little dude gets his, his comeuppance and he gets kicked bogey in the face. Um, flash forwarding a little bit, we end up in the scene where all they're all in the room talking, and I'm not gonna lie, I kind of shifted my uh, player to play this in um, plus one speed at this point because they just keep blah blah blahing. Hold, hold on, Justin, I, I'm gonna stop you here. So, as we're sitting here yapping about movies, as we do, and as you who like to yap on end. We spent like 27 hours talking about Mulholland Drive. You're going to bitch about people talking? It was just, gosh, they're just going on and on in this apartment. And oh, I was wanting to get it over with. And I, I, I listened to it normally the second time. But that first time, I was just like, granted it was late at night, but I was like, I'm with it. I mean, that's fair. You can you can have your wrong opinions. <laughs> it's, I mean, <laughs> more people think this is a masterpiece than, I mean, I thought it was pretty good. But, um, I mean, generally I, I like movies that kind of come off as like a stage play. But this one did, and I guess it's just the fact that I didn't give a shit who killed the partner. I didn't give a shit about the femme fatale. I just kind of wanted to know what the deal was up with the Maltese Falcon. And by this point, we know what the deal is up with this Maltese Falcon for the most part. So I was kind of like satisfied. So you were satisfied, but the movie wasn't finished yet? Yeah, they just kept talking. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Nope, not saying that over the air. Okay, cool. We'll continue. No, let it, let it, let it loose. Oh, you you were finished and the, the movie was still going and kind of... Uh, is that how your wife feels? No, not not, not the case at all. But uh, <laughs> going for the low blow, I thought we were going to take a maybe a no, sophisticated okay, okay. film That's approach to one, this. I said I wasn't going to say it. And two, it's the lowest hanging fruit, and I love low hanging fruit. It's my ah. favorite. <laughs> I mean, like, I can't say shit. You, you're the one married. I, you know, I'm just over here just chilling doing podcasts. So you know. There you go. Um, I didn't notice the whole palm the money thing. Um, on the first go, but on the second go, I, I noticed that more. So that that was kind of a cool thing. Apparently, in the book, like Spade is so convinced the femme fatale has the money that like he makes her go to the bathroom and strip. But um, yeah, they didn't do that in this. Uh, this is probably coming out during the Code movie. Um, let's see here. Sam ends up turning them all in at the end. Um, takes the takes the money and it's like here's evidence of the bribe they tried to give me and yeah just uh, played them all um heard comparisons from uh peter peter's character to um what does this note mean ryan hmm. i can't i can't help you there brother i'm sorry just talk let me let me figure this out 
Um, but yeah, this is uh, we we I think we skipped over an important part is uh, okay. We found out that the Maltese Falcon that uh, Sam had was fake. Yeah, because it's like coated in a, some black stuff, but then whenever Gutman starts chipping away at it, it's clearly just what it, what is it? It's uh, lead. It's lead. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. lead. And uh, they sold one of the Maltese Falcons, like from the movie, oh. for like a million dollars. Because apparently there were more than one. Because Boki dropped one and it was bent. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. Some cool okay. Stuff there. Okay, Ren is what I was looking for there. So like, I will I will listen to a review where okay, so you know where Peter Laurie's like, you idiot, you stupid idiot, or whatever. It kind of yeah. reminds you of Ren and Stimpy. Ah, oh, Ren and Stimpy. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So see, I, um, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought of that together, but yeah, I see that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Although I didn't come up with it. Um, great, great closing line. What is that? The stuff that dreams are made of. And uh, make sure you win in your next uh, trivia contest if they ask you at the last line of the Maltese Falcon. It's not the stuff that dreams are made of. You know what it is. No, I actually don't. Huh? Because <laughs> that's the response from the cop. <laughs> ah, yes. Yeah. Apparently the stuff that dreams are made of is a Shakespearean line. I probably have to research what exactly that's from. But, um... I, I could see that. And some more commentary I heard about the movie. Apparently the femme fatale, like, throughout the whole thing, like, I think she's wearing stripes at one point, And, you know, at the very end we see her behind the, um the bars of the elevator. So I guess the movie foreshadows visually that she's the crook um, or the, I guess the murderer the whole time. I didn't really pick up on that, but I felt like throwing it out there since I heard about it. I don't remember the stripes, but I like pretty early in the movie, there's a scene and I was like, yep. And there's the real bad guy. And Carl's like, yeah, there he is. And I'm like, you're talking about bogey. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's, <laughs> it's, it's homegirl. And ah. shown off, it was, in fact, Homegirl. Okay. Good on you, dude. Um, after watching this for a second time, with how great of a character Spade is and the sharp dialogue, I'll give credit, I'll give the movie its due. I, I would give it three and a half. Giving one of the all-time great classic movies a three and a half. That sounds about right. Sounds about right. Dumb and Dumber, four, four and a half stars. Maltese Falcon, three and a half. I'd love to go back to Dumb and Dumber. Dumb well, and Dumber's a classic. I, you keep using that word, and I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> oh, where's that from? Hmm, I wonder. From one of our previous episodes where we gave movies a second chance, and I gave The Princess Bride a second chance. All I right. gave it a three and a half. The same rating that Justin just gave the fucking Maltese Falcon. Yeah. I like Double Indemnity better, um, to be honest, as a uh, one of the early great noir films. You know, I people love to slam on noir films that do the whole internal monologue thing, but I really dig oh, that. So good. Huh? That's so good. I, I can't... Uh, we watched I... The Killer. Or The Killers? Uh-huh. Yeah, the killer last year. That was great. I'm ready to watch the second half of that, or not the second half, but the second, the TV version they did years later. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, and you gave this one. Hmm. One, two, three, four, five. Five stars. And I suck, David Lynch's cock. You do. Tell me that I am wrong. You go down on bogey, so we're we're even. Dude, I would I would take a million. I would take the worst bogey movie over the best David Lynch movie in a heartbeat. Oh. And when I I say best, I still mean that they're shit. Granted, that's probably unfair as I've only seen like two of his movies, but I was not impressed. <clears throat> Mic drop moment. Okay. Moving on, we'll, do, we'll agree to disagree there. I mean, All right. That's usually how we live our lives. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we are moving on to find out what pastures we will ride on next. And 
I mean, Joey cheated and I cheated. And so I gave him a pretty solid uh, guideline here. So let's see uh, what Paul Thomas Anderson movie we're going to be watching next episode. So pretty much from the time you gave me this, I had one specific movie in mind. Uh-huh. Um, but then Boogie tonight, Nights? Be before we sat down, I sat down before we started recording and I kind of was looking through some of the movies, reading the synopsis, and I had it between three movies. One okay. of them was Boogie Nights, which I have seen. It's been many, many years. And so I was like, you know, I kind of would want to rewatch that and, you know, see where, see how I feel about it now, other than being a teenager and going, oh, Roller Girl's naked. But, mm -hmm. you know, or the, the, the where they're, I think it's playing Sister Christian and they're like drugged out. Um, but I still remember that scene pretty vividly. But so then I, I took that out and I was down between this other movie I looked at and the original movie that you said you didn't really want me to pick, mm -hmm. which was Punch Drunk Love. But that's the one I really, really I have wanted to see it for a long time. It's been in my watch list. But then I read the description of this other movie, and that's what we're going to go with. And we're going to go with Inherent Vice. <laughs> Another noir film, huh? <laughs> Look, I read the description, <laughs> and it has Joaquin Phoenix. I, I was kind of sold. I don't what you want from me, fam. <laughs> you know, you know. It's do you are you aware of the reputation of this one? No. Okay. I, I wasn't familiar with it at all. I just read the description, and was like, I could watch Joaquin Phoenix do this. So okay. I need to rewatch it. Um. This is one of his more maligned ones because the noir genre is so, uh, it can be a certain taste. So, yeah, let's dive back in. Josh Brolin, Joaquin Phoenix, and here advice. Um, didn't throw me a bone, but um, we'll, Wait, we'll see what we can chew on anyways. Okay. So, did you want me to pick Boogie Nights? I wanted you to pick There Will Be Blood. Nice. Actually, I thought you were going to pick Heart 8, which... I would have been more disappointed about Heart Eight than um, Inherent Vice. At least Inherent Vice, I need to get a sec give the second chance to. But yeah, negative, negative Ghost Rider on the There Will Be Blood. I threw you a bone, a nice chewy bone, and, and I never got reciprocated. Roadhouse. You threw me. Yeah, you you picked Roadhouse. I because I knew you seen... loved Roadhouse. Yes, but you like. And then a and bunch then you of... returned the favor with. Oh, Quentin Tarantino movie. I guess we'll go with the Rod Rodriguez movie. How is it not a Quentin Tarantino movie? He wrote it and he starred in it. We should have watched Jackie Brown that episode, but I'm just saying. Look. Maybe we should have. Maybe we shouldn't have watched Dancer in the Dark as a fucking musical movie, but we did. <laughs> we so... like to bend the rules. Yes, we do. All right, so, okay, and hair and vice. And we are, okay, so we're turning to the Wheel of Destiny. Yep, it's your turn. Mm -hmm. One to 47, I guess. Let's see what we get. Generate 43. Ooh. Kind of there in the middle. Scrolling down my list, 43. What will 43... Throw us. We are going to watch Jackie. Interesting. Jackie. With, with Natalie Portman. We're watching, we're watching a movie about Mila Kunis? No. Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kennedy's wife from uh, I kinda, I... 2016. Okay. Interesting. You never know what the Wheel of Destiny is going to throw at you. But yeah, oddly heard... enough, my movie 43 is from 2017, so there we go. Okay. I just recently put this on my list, actually. This has been uh, yeah, on my more recent movies to watch list for a while, and um, I heard Natalie Portman's um, performance is great, and we're both history buffs, so bring on Jackie. Jackie and Inherent Vice, only on the Average Joe's Movie Clubcast. Yeah, we do some we do some weird stuff. Eclectic. You know, we, we do. Uh, that is, but that is why I like. Uh, I really enjoyed the season two setup, so we could see where we like. As much as I give you shit about 
uh, Dancer in the Dark. Like that was a very good juxtaposition into our taste. musicals. Our, our taste picking a movie within the same category, et cetera, et cetera. So. Well, well, this is cool because, I mean, you throw a category at me. I give you, you know, my interpretation of that, and then we spin, we spin the wheel on another one. I, you, oh, yeah, you, pre- no, this... you, you prefer last season's format? I, I like last season's format a little bit better just because I thought the, the episodes were more, co- more coherent. Mm-hmm. But Cohesive. Cohesive, yes, cohesive. I mean, the way I talk might be incoherent, but at least the episodes were cohesive. <laughs> yes, but this also, you know, it, I, I think this, um, in how, you know, you give me a category and then how my thought process goes in to picking whatever movie I pick and vice versa. Um, at least I don't pick two movies out of the same category, but... All right. I, I had to throw my, I had to throw Max a bone, and I wanted to throw myself a bone too. So that's how we had, we, and we, and it was cohesive. It was, it was. Um, you, if it had been maybe Blanca instead of, uh, it had uh, even been more cohesive. I guess that would have been a war movie, but uh, that I mean, was on your Wheel of Destiny list. Yeah, it wasn't because I've seen that and I loved it, and I wa- made an unboxing video on it. It's on our channel, so check it out um, if you Word. haven't already or watch it again. So where are we going um, in the future? All right. So I'm going to give you this category. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to pay for this in two weeks, but you know, hey, know fuck you it, here we go. So let's, let's, let's back up to the very beginning of this episode. <laughs> you mentioned um, the island. What do I have to pick a I Michael did. Bay flick? Yes, a directed Michael Bay movie. That is the one. That is the category. <laughs> We're having a Michael Bay episode. Yes, yes we are. And look, I know how much you love the Criterion Collection, and he's got two movies in the collection. So he does. He certainly does. He does. So will it be Transformers 3? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> the last night, perhaps. Will it be Pain and Gain? Will it be Bad Boys Two? I've never seen that one. Um, uh, I have not either. Actually, I don't know if I've seen the first one. To be honest with you, you haven't seen any of the Bad Boys movies. Wow. I don't... Yeah, not 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 producer. It is director, and there are eighteen of them. I thought so, he, uh, I thought he, do- I thought he directed Bad Boys Three, but um, he did not. So, yeah, he did. Which that's a trend. Yeah, he did like three, four Transformers. Oh shit, he did uh, five Transformers. He did that. Uh, that uh, Benghazi movie. Is that the Thirty Three Hours? Yep. Uh huh. So yeah. Mm hmm. There's a few things in there I haven't seen yet, so we'll have to stir the pot and see uh, what we come up with. So, interesting. I I think it's really actually only 14 movies, because like four of these don't exist. So, I'll but. definitely pick uh, Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. I mean, so. you pick whatever the, whatever the hell you want, brother. Yeah, yeah you did inherent vice, so. Um, did you straight up say I want you to pick There Will Be Blood? Um, no. Because if you, if you want There Will Be Blood, you just have to, like, put it... Oh, oh man, if we had categories where each picked one, you could have had it. Thank God we don't, because I don't <laughs> want to rewatch that movie. Oh, that man, one. you'll like it so much I better don't, the I next time. I don't want to drink from your milkshake and then drink from my milkshake. Like, none of that. I think I bashed him with a bowling pin. I mean, at least then I wouldn't have to watch that movie anymore. Ouch. Okay, <laughs> so uh, next time it'll be um, hair advice, or maybe incoherent advice, as many say, and uh, Jackie. And then we'll see where we're going with Michael Bay. And another random movie, this time from my Wheel of Destiny. If you'd like us to answer any questions on the show, we would be glad to do so. Or you can just hear us, you know, bickering back and forth. But if they'd like to talk to us, how could they do it? Uh, they can uh, leave us an email at theaveragejoesmovieclubcast at gmail.com. 
um, which you can go to our Facebook page, Cruz Movie Clubcast. Press the big red button. It'll set up the email for you. You can go into the comments down below. Um, you know, ask a shit like, why are we so dumb? And <laughs> Why does Justin does not like the Maltese Falcon? He's such a fucking moron. Yeah, why, why doesn't Joey like There Will Be Blood considered one of the best movies of the modern era? You know, hey, you can you can ask us these things and more, although I sometimes feel like we're fairly vocal. Um, yep, um, I try like to, I try to not leave any questions. Yeah, I mean, I think both of us love the hot take, especially seeing the other person's um, reaction. But uh, you can also, if you follow us on Letterboxd, you can leave us comments there. We do appreciate it um quite a lot and uh if you're friends with us on you know like personally on facebook or twitter or instagram or whatever you can ask us those questions there too and we'll make sure that it uh it gets handled on the show and one last thing uh no one said anything about it but last week uh not last week last episode uh when i went on on a a very fiery tirade against the blue velvet I said that it was a David Cronenberg movie, and I'm sorry. I did not mean to demean his skill by comparing him to David Lynch. Um, so for that, I apologize to Mr. Cronenberg. And with that being said, Justin, why do we do this show? Because we love talking about movies. Good night, everybody. That's all, folks. Just my, my mate's.